Those doors opened and the fear went away as I delved inside my manuscript and entered the world of my book. As authors, we deal with fear every day, don't we? Fear that we'll never have another good idea, fear that what we have written is terrible, fear that we will never be able to fix it. But here's what I know. Everyone has doubts, but nothing in the world takes the place of persistence. Even in the face of fear, even in the face of the unknown, our writers know we put our fingers on the keys and we keep going forward. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you, but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 264 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. As I mentioned in episode 263, this is going to be part two of the When Words Collide 2022 keynotes, and this episode features keynote talks from Hank Philippi Ryan and Edward Willett. Now, I'm going to bypass most of the introductory matter for this episode because it's coming so soon on the heels of episode 263, and that allows you to get right into the awesome keynotes. But first, before we go there, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. Want to publish an audiobook? There are three ways to wide publish with Findaway Voices. As a self-published author, you've probably heard about the booming audiobook industry and its 10 years of year-over-year consistent growth. You want to get that beautiful book you've written heard by the ears of a new audience as an audiobook. But how do you get your audiobook made and available on a plethora of audiobook listening platforms out there? The process from creation to distribution is remarkably simple with Findaway Voices, through the three paths that they offer on their platform. Marketplace. You're in the driver's seat with a Marketplace production. Marketplace enables an author or publisher to manage the entire audiobook production process, starting with finding the right voice for your story from thousands of professional narrators and voice actors. You have full control and are solely responsible for production management. You'll be responsible for the contract between the rights holder, that's you, the author, and the narrator, of which Findaway Voices provides an incredibly comprehensive sample contract which you can use. You and the narrator agree to payment terms and how you process the payment outside of Findaway Voices. Basically, you're the casting director in a marketplace production. Managed audiobook production. Well, this is audiobook productions that are produced directly with Findaway Voices. One of their experienced casting directors will provide you with a list of proven narrators that they've worked with, where you listen to samples and find the exposition that fits your story. Now, they work directly with you to find the perfect voice for your story. They take care of the contract management payment and provide you with production updates throughout the entire process. Casting, contract management, payment processing, and production management can be potentially intimidating for a first-time audiobook author, and it may be a burden to some authors. So in this case, they'll walk you through it step by step. Now, if you have existing audiobooks or you've self-narrated your book, you can use Findaway Voices as well. That's their final and third option, where you've produced the audiobook outside of Findaway Voices. And of course, prior to uploading your finished audiobook files, you want to make sure your audio, your audiobook and your artwork is to specification and that your narrator knows about their technical requirements. But you, the author, not the narrator, will be the one to load the audio on Findaway Voices. So bringing finished audiobooks to Findaway Voices for distribution is easy to do. You can add cover art, create metadata, and upload your final files. Of course, all three options use their simple distribution pricing model. In all three project options, you keep 80% of your royalties, and Findaway Voices keeps 20%. They have a strong, wide, global audiobook distribution network of over 40 retail and library partners. And if you want to see how you can leverage Findaway Voices and learn more about this, check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. 
Well, that's it for the introductory matter. Just a brief um, sort of prelude to this is I was the host or MC of When Words Collide, the virtual keynote talks for When Words Collide 2022. And I had the great honor of getting to introduce and interact and ask questions of Terry Brooks, Susanna Kearsley, Hank Philip Ryan, and Edward Willett. They were the four guests of honor from When Words Collide this year. And in episode 263, you heard from Terry Brooks and Susanna Kearley. And now in this episode, you're going to hear from Hank Philip Ryan and Edward Willett. And of course, after you hear their keynotes, I'm going to offer my own brief reflection about some of the things that they shared. So without further ado, let's get to Hank Philip Ryan and Edward Willett. Hank Philippi Ryan is the USA Today best-selling author of 14 psychological thrillers, winning the genre's most prestigious awards, five Agathas, four Anthonys, and the coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. She's also an investigative reporter for Boston's WHDH-TV, winning 37 Emmys. Book reviewers call her a master of suspense and superb and gifted storyteller. The First to Lie garnered a Publishers Weekly starred review and was nominated for the Anthony Award for Best Novel and Mary Higgins Clark Award. Her current thriller, Her Perfect Life, received starred reviews from Kirkus and Publishers Weekly, which called it a superlative thriller. It is now an Agatha nominee for Best Novel of the Year. Watch for The House Guest, coming in 2023. Good evening. Good evening. And so wonderful to see you all. Susanna, I am so with you. Susanna knows I'm a big fan of hers. And I also taught a masterclass this morning for three hours. So if I sound a little like Brenda Vaccaro, that is why. And I hope you all enjoyed that. Wow. It is so nice to see you all. And I have to say, this is not exactly how I thought it would be. I thought, I thought I'd finally get to come to Calgary in person, but alas, that is still in the future. I have to admit, and I know this is probably similar for all of you, that not one of the past days since March 12, 2020 has been what I expected. Isn't that absolutely true? Back then, I was in the middle of writing this book, Her Perfect Life, when the pandemic hit. I was 15,000 words into this book, and I was feeling fabulous. And I flew to West Palm Beach, Florida for a big book event. And I was writing like crazy on the plane, feeling powerful and really loving my book. But I will admit, even then, I was already a little bit terrified. Should I be going, I thought? Remember how uncertain we all felt at that time. So I did the event with the fear in my heart, balanced with the joy of seeing 250 people in a room all holding my book. Um, the murder list was out at the time. And I hightailed it back to the airport, thinking all I want to do is go home. I knew I was on the right track of going home when I got into the airport and I was in the jet blue waiting area. And some people were already wearing masks at that point. And there was a woman in the jet blue waiting area who had a mask on. And at one point she pulled down her mask and then she sneezed and then she put her mask back on. And I thought, okay, I'm done. I just want to go home. So you should know that usually an airplane is my favorite place to write. And you know, I guess I feel contained in it and I have a deadline. I'm gonna be home in two hours. I'm gonna write my thousand words a day on that plane. But at that time, I remember I opened my laptop and I pulled up my manuscript and I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't write. I just stared at the screen. And as the terror of the unknown hit me, I wondered if I would ever be the same again. So now, 500 days later, a thousand days later, however many days later it is, I, I, we are not the same. We are not the same, but we are writers and we are professionals. And as the result of the pandemic, we have all learned, we have all learned a lot. And that is my title for tonight's keynote. I'll tell you what the real title is. I'm really rubbish at titles, but the title that I chose was 
the top 10 things I learned about writing during the pandemic that then I realized I already knew. But that is not that is not a very good title. But the top 10 things I learned during the pandemic as a writer that I realized I already knew. And let me share those 10 things with you right now. The first thing we learned as people and as writers is that we learned how to deal with fear. We learned, number one, we learned how to deal with fear. How many of us, as we sat down to write at the beginning of the pandemic, sat at our computers alone, at home, unable to write, in our little rooms with the people outside, unable to write? There was a layer of fear hovering over our shoulders wasn't there at the time and on every page that fear came through and it was difficult for me to write as i said that fear on the plane lasted when i got home to sit here at this computer where i've written for the past 15 years but at some moment i decided it is always safe inside my manuscript it's always safe inside a book. And, I, and I, those doors opened and the fear went away as I delved inside my manuscript and entered the world of my book. As authors, we deal with fear every day, don't we? Fear that we'll never have another good idea, fear that what we have written is terrible, fear that we will never be able to fix it. But here's what I know, everyone has doubts but nothing in the world takes the place of persistence. Even in the face of fear, even in the face of the unknown, our writers know we put our fingers on the keys and we keep going forward. How many of you have read, and I wish I could see you all, how many of you know the book Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. It is a marvelous book on writing. And if you don't have it, not right now, don't get it right now, wait till the keynotes are over. But after that, go get Bird by Bird. And the way, the reason that book was titled Bird by Bird is that when Anne Lamott, the writer, was growing up, she had a little brother. And one morning at breakfast, her brother told her dad that he had to write a book about the birds of North America, the birds of North America, and that it was due the next day. And his brother, you know, her little brother was whining and saying, Dad, Dad, how am I supposed to write a book about the birds of North America in one day? And his father said to him, bird by bird, buddy, bird by bird. And that is how we are as writers, isn't it? We know that we have to go word by word, bird by bird, word by word every day. And if we just persist and advance the story, we will have a book at the end. And number two, that is comes out of bird by bird. What we learned in the pandemic is that we have to go day by day, don't we? We learn to put one foot in front of the other, to see what happened the next day, and just go on. And especially in writing, because even with word by word, writing is difficult. And in fact, what I learned during the pandemic is if you're not working, if you're not feeling that it's difficult, you're probably not working hard enough. Most books, and you writers should know this, most books start out as really bad first drafts. So just keep, like what I do is I just, I look at, I, I can't begin to tell you that I, I'll type a sentence and I'll say, wow, that is terrible. That is the worst thing that anybody has ever written. And I think, yep, just go on and write another terrible sentence and write another terrible sentence and write another terrible sentence. You are not writing a book, just persevere. You are writing a page. If you think to myself, if you think to yourself, oh my golly, I have to write an entire book. How am I going to do that? You'll just stop yourself. It's too big an obstacle. Just write word by word, a page a day. 250 words a day. And if you write that page a day, by this time next year, in the next When Words Collide, you will have a first draft of the book. If you have a hard time writing, don't give up. It doesn't mean you're a bad writer. It just means that you're having a bad day. You're having a bad day. The key, the key is to just do it. Just do it. Don't leave this world regretting that you didn't finish your book. But don't leave this world having given up. When I was writing, my, when I hit the wall, I have to say, on my first book, I called my mom and I said, mom, I'm so bummed. You know, I love this book. I think it's going to be good, but I just, I'm not sure if I can finish it. And my mom said, well, dear, 
You will if you want to. You will if you want to. And I realized that was the essence of everything, wasn't it? It was all about my passion and my compulsion and my obsession and my desire to write this book. You will if you want to. My, one of my favorite quotes is from Thomas Edison. And he said, when you think you have exhausted all of the possibilities, remember this, you haven't. It's not that there is no solution to your book problem. It's just that you haven't thought of it yet. And I promise you that you will. Um, and that leads me to num another thing we have learned. Number three, we have learned to be brave. During the pandemic, as writers and as people, we have learned to be brave. We have learned that in life, we cannot know the future. We don't know. And when we take a step outside our door every time, there are dangers that we can't imagine. And we have to do the best we can every day. Writing a book is not that dangerous, isn't it? Is it? It's not that dangerous. So be brave there too. Just try it. Just write it. It's not your book is not a test. You can go back, you can edit, you can erase, you can do it over, you can see what works. No one is going to see it until you show them. So just keep at it. Stephen King says the hardest part is just before you start. And isn't that so true? Because once you are doing it, once you are in the pages of your manuscript, you are involved, you are subsumed, you are passionate about it. Just do it. Just start. No one, no matter what is going on in the world around you, it is safe inside your manuscript. It is always safe inside your manuscript. Another thing that we learned in the pandemic, number four, classics are classics for a reason. Stories are memorable and valuable. And sometimes going back to what makes us comfortable can be rewarding. How many of you read your favorite books during the pandemic? Why do we love them? Why do we as readers and writers love them? Think about it. We have learned in the pandemic to go back to basics, to health and shelter and friends and food and love and family and our love of books and writing. The pandemic has shown us what is important, not only in our lives, but in the pages of the books. When you read your favorites, what do you learn from them? That there's a character you care about, a problem that needs to be solved, that the good guys win and the bad guys get what's coming to them. And in the end, you, you change the world a little bit and you get some justice. That's all you need to know for your book. Write something that will give readers the same joy that those classics give to you. Number five, we have learned in this pandemic, haven't we, that we are nimble. We are nimble. We can pivot. We can go from waking up in the morning and going to work and sending our kids in the school and coming home at night at six o'clock to make dinner to all being together in the same house every day and being terrified to go outside and still making it work. We have learned to grab our time to write when we can. It, maybe it's not how it used to be, but we can make it work. If you can handle the terror of the pandemic, you can write a book, can't you? Things that seemed impossible at one point might seem more conquerable now. Sue Grafton used to say, get over yourself. You're only writing a book, right? It is always safe inside a book and savor your new perspective. You can juggle, you can balance, you can make your life work. Number six, we have learned that we can study and learn and get it right. Think how much we didn't know about COVID when this started and think how much our knowledge has grown over these months. We can do that in writing too. And look at you, you are here. You have taken a big step in coming to this conference and think how much you will learn. Think how much your life will change at this conference. You have put your trust in your own brain in your power to learn and in your power of understanding. As Terry said, do you read? Do you study? Um, have you been mindful about your place in this wonderful profession? This is where we grow. This is where we learn. This is where we take it all in and learn about how to be a writer. We have time to do that now. Um, number seven, 
We have learned patience, haven't we? We have learned patience. That's number seven. We have learned that things may take longer, things may get canceled, things may not happen at all. At all. And we have learned get, to get over that a little bit. We've learned to expect disappointment a little bit and take that um, and take that as a as a take that at ease. Take that um, without being upset about it. Take that as an everyday thing that's going to happen. Yep, as Terry said, everything's going to change. So one of the things about writing is patience. Nothing is going to happen overnight, especially not the acceptance of your management. Uh, sorry, especially not the acceptance of your manuscript, the word I'm looking for so carefully, by your agent or editor. So don't rush, no matter how much you want to, don't rush don't get swept away by your first novel enthusiasm to make it really good takes much longer than you think it will and to send in your first manuscript too early will make you miserable because you only get one chance to command someone's attention send it out before it's ready and you are squandering your opportunity to find your perfect champion when in doubt what we have learned from the pandemic when in doubt wait just wait, wait a week, wait two weeks, and then read it again, and then call me and tell me how right I was that we should embrace being patient. Number eight, and we, because in the pandemic, we have learned, as I said, we have learned things are not always going to work the way we hope. And that means for us as writers, there are going to be rejections. There are going to be disappointments there is going to be unhappiness. It is part of the deal. Editors and agents in our writing life will say no. You're going to hear no. But that rejection is not about you. It's not personal. Something there is, sometimes there isn't anything wrong with the book an editor rejects. It's just not the book that they were looking for. I had so let me just read you very, very quickly. This is one of my rejection letters for my first novel. I'll just read it a tiny bit. This says, thank you so much for sending Primetime by Hank Philip e. Ryan. The author has such an engaging voice and her firsthand knowledge of the broadcast industry, combined with her own impressive position, blah, blah, really make this project stand out. Unfortunately, after giving it considerable thought, I'm afraid we'll be passing on this project. And let me tell you what happened. I know it was devastated. Let me tell you what happened with that disappointment. Two days later, that editor called my agent back and said, I can't get Hank's plot out of my head, but it's too light and too chicklity for me. Can she rewrite the whole novel as a big women's fiction mystery and then send it back in? And my agent asked me if I could do that. And I said, I'm a writer, I'm a writer, watch me write. And I rewrote that entire book and that became Primetime, which won the Agatha for Best Novel of the Year. I was rejected, and that prize came as a result of the rejection. So take it in stride. It's going to happen, and you never know what wonderful thing is around the next corner, step by step, bird by bird. Number nine is a big one. We have learned in the pandemic that people will not always agree with us. People will not always agree with us. Nothing has made that anything more clear than that during this pandemic. And in book world, we think we're grownups, but it's very difficult to take criticism of your writing. It's very difficult to take criticism of your manuscripts. When someone tells you that your character seems kind of wimpy or in the middle of the book kind of sags or your amateur sleuth like, why didn't she just call the police? Um, your, your, first, your first action is going to be to feel defensive. You're going to start defending yourself about this criticism. But keep in mind, you don't have to think what they think. You don't have to do what they say. But you might just, if you listen, you might just learn something. We have learned during the pandemic to try to keep an open mind. Keep in mind that as for reviews, I can tell you, I can tell you not to read them, um, but you will. So if you do, remember this. 
A review is just what one person thinks. It's just what one person thinks. It is not the truth, okay? It is not the truth. It is just what one person thinks. And that is the final thing that I have to talk to you about tonight. Number 10, what I've learned from the pandemic is that we have learned in this pandemic that we are a community. We rely on each other as writers. We care about each other as writers and people. We are in this together. We have learned to be patient, to be generous. We have learned to be helpful and kind, to take care of our writer friends, to be authentically happy for their successes, right? It's everybody can win. Everybody can have a turn. If a friend wins or gets on the bestseller list and you don't, be genuinely happy for them. Your turn will come. And that is what brings us together tonight, that this race goes to the persistent and to the devoted and those who understand that we are so lucky and that what we're doing is special. Do you know the folk singer, Judy Collins? Please tell me that you do. I told my producer, who's about 30, that my husband and I were going to go hear Judy Collins at a concert several years ago. And my producer says, Great, that sounds wonderful. I had, you know, that she had no idea who Judy Collins was. And I said, you know, Judy Collins, the folk singer. She sang both sides now. I said, I couldn't have gotten through college without listening to her records. Um, and my producer says, Re records? No, she knew what a record was. She knew what a record was. I know she does. But anyway, Judy Collins, who was 72 at the time of this concert, gorgeous, big, uh, gray, gorgeous hair, very, very slinky, tight pants, black boots. She hasn't lost one bit of her voice. She was quite amazing. And she told us a story about how when she was a little girl growing up in Denver, her parents had told her that she was going to be a concert pianist, that her destiny was to be a concert pianist. And she practiced and took lessons and that's all that her life was about. But she told us that she knew from the minute she knew anything that she was destined to be a folk singer. And she told us that at age 19, she decided, forget about this piano thing, I'm moving to New York. And she said, I, I packed my bags and I moved to New York to be a folk singer. And she said, I took my songs with me. I took all my songs with me. And then she said, of course, I hadn't written any of them yet. I hadn't written any of them yet, she said. And that just touched me because I think we all have songs. We all have songs. We may just not have written them yet. So my message to you is go and write your songs. And I cannot wait to hear them. Edward Willett is the award-winning author of more than 60 books of science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction for readers of all ages, including the World Shaper series and the Masks of Agarima trilogy as E.C. Blake, for Daw Books, the YA fantasy series The Shards of Excalibur, and the YA SF novel Star Song, among many others. He won Canada's Aurora Award for Best Long Form Work in English in 2009 for Masaguro and for Best Fan Related Work in 2019 for the World Shapers podcast where he interviews other science fiction and fantasy authors about the creative process. He's been shortlisted several times. His 12th novel for Daw Books, the humorous space opera, The Tangled Stars, comes out this fall. Ed is also the owner of Shadowpaw Press, named after his black Siberian cat, which has published two anthologies of short fiction by guests of the World Shapers podcast, Shapers of Worlds and Shapers of Worlds Volume 2. Volume 3 is planned for this fall. Ed's nonfiction titles run the gamut from children's science books and biographies to local histories to genetics demystified, published by McGraw-Hill. A former newspaper reporter and editor, Ed is also a professional actor and singer who has performed in numerous plays, operas, and musicals over the years. Ed lives in Regina, Saskatchewan with his wife, Margaret Ann Hodges, a past president of the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Saskatchewan. They have a college-aged daughter, Alice. Thanks, Mark. And uh, here I am batting cleanup here at the end, thanks uh, by virtue of having a W as my uh, 
uh, first letter of my last name. It seems like my whole life I've been coming in last because of alphabetical order. You know, I should I should uh, launch some sort of a campaign to end that. <laughs> but here I am. And um, that just ties in pretty well with what several of the other guests have said. I, I wanted I want to cast your minds back to August 1977. There were two important things happening that month. Uh, one was that I was on my way to Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas, where I would be going into journalism uh, as my major. Uh, my parents were driving me down there. And if you're wondering why I went to Arkansas, it's because that uh, university, which was affiliated with the Churches of Christ, was where my parents had met, as they like to say, at uh, two o'clock in the morning in the backseat of a car, <laughs> where they were to, you know, to be fair to my parents, all they were doing was getting a ride with somebody home for Christmas. But uh, that's where we were going in 1977. And so that starting journalism at the university was kind of the start of my attempt to become a professional writer. The other thing that happened in August 1977 was the release of a second compilation by the Grateful Dead, which was called What a Long Strange Trip It's Been. I'm pretty sure I was completely unaware of that at the time, not being a Grateful Dead listener, since our family, we tended more to the countryside of things. But uh, looking back now, it's kind of auspicious that that came out the same year that I began my uh, professional writing career in a way, because uh, it has been a long, strange trip. And it occurred to me that what might be interesting for this keynote address was to talk about the ways that writing careers can be unexpected, that they don't necessarily follow what you expect them to be, and that there are an awful lot of things you can do as a writer uh, that you may not have thought of, and I have done quite a few of them. And now, to be fair, my actual writing career started a bit earlier than that. Um, I knew fairly early on that I wanted to be a writer. I wrote my first complete short story. I was 11 years old, and it was called Castro Glass Hypership Test Pilot. So you can see that my mind was pretty much set on uh, science fiction very early on. Of course, I was reading all the usual things, uh, Tolkien and Narnia and uh, Madeline Lingo has been mentioned tonight already in one of the, the keynotes. Um, I was reading all of that. Andre Norton was a big influence, Robert A. Heinlein, you know, that's the era I come from, Isaac Asimov, et cetera. It's hard to stop listing them once I start. <laughs> uh, I wrote three novels in high school. In fact, in fact, the third one, The Slavers of Thok, you can tell it was a serious fantasy novel because it had a map. There it is. That's the map to my grade 11 novel, Slavers of Thok. So about the time that Terry was writing Sword of Shannara, I was writing Slavers of Thok, uh, that you will probably never read, <laughs> Slavers of Thok. Uh, but I decided somewhere along in there that I wanted to be a professional writer, but I was also reading the writing magazines, and I saw that you could not be a professional writer right off the bat. And I thought, well, while I'm waiting to sell my first novel, because I was convinced at the age of 17 or so that as soon as I sold a novel, my path would be easy uh, from then on. That's all I had to do was sell that first novel, but it might take a year or two. I thought, well, what could I do that would be related to writing? And that's why I went into journalism. I had no burning desire to be a journalist. Uh, I actually found being a reporter a little uncomfortable. I didn't really like asking people impertinent questions, and that kind of <laughs> defines the life of a reporter. But I did it. I went off, I got my journalism degree, I came back, uh, I started at the Weyburn Review as a newspaper reporter and a photographer, and already th things started to take kind of an odd turn. They hired me as a, I was only 20, and they hired me as a sports reporter, and the only sport I'd ever played was one year of high school football. I was covering hockey, which I'd never interested me in the slightest, despite growing up in Canada, because we had moved up there from Texas. And as I even had a sports call of it was called, I kid you not, the sport hole, uh, where I would write things about sports, which was certainly nothing I had ever thought I would be writing when I decided I wanted to be a writer. Uh, I also had another column called Eddying Thoughts, which was kind of whatever came into my head. And all through that time, though, I was still I was still thinking, I'm just going to get that first novel. And I was writing all that on the side. I was writing fiction, but I was writing all the time. Uh, feature articles. I interviewed politicians. I interviewed somebody who climbed Everest. I interviewed a television evangelist. I interviewed, oh, a young computer geek. I interviewed athletes. Uh, week after week after week, I was writing thousands of words. Uh, and I was a professional writer, but I still wasn't quite what I had thought my career as a professional writer was going to be. And that just kind of continued. So after I'd been at the Wave Interview, at the ripe old age of 24, I became news editor. 
and I edited the newspaper for four years. And then I saw an opportunity to come to Regina, where I live now, as communications officer for the Saskatchewan Science Center. I wasn't particularly interested in the communication side of that, the public relations side of that. The only thing I remembered from my public relations class, and I often quoted, is that 90% of public relations is wasted and nobody knows which 90% it is. The other one was don't lie to the press, but I think that one is often ignored by PR people. But uh, I, I had an opportunity to write science exhibit copy, and I'd always enjoyed writing about science. So, okay, I would do that. Meanwhile, pumping out those novels and not getting a taker anywhere. Uh, I don't know how many I had by the time I moved up here. It must have been four or five unpublished novels, but I was writing, and by my career was at least I was doing something with words. So I was at the Science Center for five years, and finally, in 1993, I quit my job to become a full-time professional writer, and the first thing I did was go on a school opera company tour as an opera singer, <laughs> because... Whatever would pay the bills is what I discovered it means to be a, a freelance writer uh, right off the bat. And that has kind of been my motto ever since. I have written a lot of different things. I wanted to tell you about some of the more unusual ones. I mean, okay, admittedly, if you want to have a life as a freelance writer, perhaps the opera singing thing does not apply to each and every one of you. Although if you could get into it, it certainly is fun. And I've done a lot of uh, other theater. In fact, Right off the bat, I actually, before I did the opera tour, I was playing Santa Claus for a small uh, company that did kind of Christmas shows. So, ho, 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 I got very good at that. And uh, oddly enough, I got to play him again later, and I got to play Scrooge, too, all in the same uh, in the same production. So, you know, the acting side of things is is has been a great little sideline, but writing was always what I really wanted to do. So some of the other things I've written, let's see. Well, um, right off the bat, I finally got my first book. My first book was published. My first book, I was so excited. It had my name on it, had a little bio, the whole thing. My first book was using Microsoft Publisher for Windows 95. And it was so successful. There was a sequel using Microsoft Publisher for Windows 97. I'm sure I'm Spielberg somehow has missed those, but at any moment, I'm expecting him to, to get in touch and make those into major motion pictures. I'm sure, that's going to happen. I wrote uh, books about using Microsoft Office and using Microsoft Publisher. I got flown down to America Online headquarters when there still was such a thing in uh, outside Washington, D.C. And I wrote a book about uh, creating cool web pages using uh, AOL's software at the time. All this stuff, very interesting. Nothing to do with what I really wanted to write, which was fiction, which I was writing, but not selling a lot of. I had sold a, a couple of short stories. My first short story was not science fiction and fantasy. It was probably... Uh, it was inspired by working at the Weyburn Review, and it was a story about two kids trapped in a blizzard on the Saskatchewan landscape, published in Western People, um, which was the magazine of the Western producer agricultural newspaper. My second story, I sold another story to Western producer, and I'm happy to say is probably the only science fiction short story ever published, ever published in the Western producer agricultural magazine. It involved, it's complicated, but it involved aliens who were growing exploding onions and things like that. To, uh, it's really hard to explain. But anyway, it was called Strange Harvest. I do remember that. Still, though, no novels. I was writing these computer books. Um, I mentioned the Sports Reporter, Science Center. I started doing a science column while I was at the Science Center. Uh, I wrote about the science of everyday things. I did that for almost 20 years, a column that uh, I was a regular guest on CBC Afternoon Edition uh, here in uh, Regina. and. I, I did uh, a science column uh, starting at the Science Center, and then I took it freelance, and I did it for all those years. It was in the local paper. It was in some other papers. It was in St. John's uh, Newfoundland paper for a while, the Evening Telegram out there, and a few others like that. Never expected to do that. Still wasn't what I really wanted to do, which was make a living full time as a fiction writer. That's always what I was aiming for. Wasn't there. Uh, my first novel finally did come out during this time frame. Uh, it was called Soul Worm. It was published by one of the worst publishers in the world. And uh, the sequel came out. I actually have the sequel here because it also it was not a sequel, but my second book for that same publisher has the worst cover art I have ever had on any book with my name on it. Uh, Dark Unicorn, it was called. And you can see it's it's really not good. However, at least I had a couple of novels out. They made absolutely no money. I got some uh, awards nominations, though. That was nice. Still not getting to where I wanted to do. I wanted to make a living as a writer. 
Still wasn't doing it. What else did I do? Communications officer for the uh, city of Regina for a while, uh, up on top of the uh, city hall, which is a 17 story building here. I was up on the 16th floor, 17th is where the mayor's office was. And it was literally a case of don't look out the window in the morning because you'll have nothing to do in the afternoon. I remember doing a whole thing about trivia about the city that was supposed to be published in the newspaper. Nothing ever happened with it, but they, they paid me. And I actually got quite a bit of writing done up there because on WordPerfect, I had to use that um, because I really had nothing to do. But yeah, it was, I was there. Uh, I did a, a, a stint as the advertorial editor for the, uh, the Leader Post, the Regina Leader Post, which was advertorials are that stuff that read like editorial, but they're actually paid for. So they're usually about new businesses that are starting up or stuff like that. I was doing that at the time. Other freelance stuff that I had never thought I would be doing. I wrote stuff for a magazine called Inquest. And actually, that one is one of the ones I really wanted to mention because I wrote an article for Inquest, which was it was not uh, computer gaming, but it was like Magic the Gathering and those kind of card games. And uh, I wrote one called uh, an article that I presented as the foreword to a book supposedly entitled Dragons, Our Fiery Friends by a fellow named Dr. Vladimir Kapasonik. And I said he'd been struggling for years to finish his definitive treatise on the science of dragons, inspired by the one he had seen as a small boy in 1911, mislabeled as a rare winged garter snake in a traveling fair. And that Dr. Kapasonik was then 98 years old and in a nursing home in Moose Jaw, <laughs> because Moose Jaw is just a funny uh, place name, and hoping to find someone else to carry on his life's work before it was too late. Never thought any more about it. That was fun. I enjoyed writing it. It was this little little funny thing. And then I started to get the occasional letter from kids asking me to pass on their names to Dr. Kapasonic because they wanted to carry on his work. And uh, I think I put some of it online and pretty soon it was popping up in PowerPoint presentations. He was like a, a go-to source for dragons. And it was on a, a Harry Potter fan site. He was an authority cited in someone's recreation of what a course in dragon studies might be like at Hogwarts. And it showed up uh, on various pages devoted to dragons and myth and folklore. And he was even an authority cited in a term paper on dragons on a site that sold term papers to students. I thought, well, that's that's interesting. I never would have pictured that happening when I decided to become a writer. Uh, I did eventually confess uh, that I had made the whole thing up. I didn't think I had to confess that, but I did in one of my science columns. But it still pops up. If I did a search just today, and you can still find traces of it on the internet of that particular article. Another part of my long, strange trip. Uh, some of the nonfiction I've written was mentioned earlier on That is that has been part of my long, strange trip. I have written biographies of, uh, let's see, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Andy Warhol, and Johnny Cash. So I lived in the 60s vicariously. I mean, I did live in the 60s, but I was a small boy uh, as I wrote all that. Got to put Weyburn in because Weyburn is uh, where the term psychedelic was termed because they did LSD research in the Saskatchewan Mental Hospital, which was uh, in Weyburn. A uh, little known fact. And I put that in. I got to you know, sneak that in when I could. Uh, so I did that. I wrote other biographies. I wrote a biography of the Ayatollah Khomeini. That was a fun one. Uh, I wrote uh, biographies of Orson Scott Card and uh, uh, J.R. Tolkien and another author, Akira Cass, uh, for some another series. I wrote a book about the Iran-Iraq War. I wrote uh, a book about the mutiny on the bounty. I wrote several books about diseases, which is always fun because you always think you have them as you're writing them. And all the things that kill you really quick start with flu-like symptoms. So I did one on Ebola, flu-like symptoms. I did one on meningitis, flu-like symptoms. I did one on uh, hemophilia, which I wasn't worried about because that's genetic. And I did one on Alzheimer's, I think. I, I can't remember. <laughs> that's a terrible joke. I did one on arthritis. Uh, so, you know, lots of diseases. I did some other science stuff. Some of the weirdest ones, I did a book on how to skateboard. Never been on a skateboard in my life. I wrote a book about rock climbing, not a big sport in Saskatchewan. Uh, and I had never done it, and, but I wrote a book on it. Uh, and that's another thing that's been interesting about this long, strange trip is the number of things that I have learned by not just being able to focus on the fiction. And yeah, the fiction was happening all through that time. I mean, I started selling books to better publishers. I eventually started selling to Daw, one of the best publishers you can be with. Um, but I never got to the point where that was the sole thing I could do. It still isn't the sole thing I could do. So I continued writing other things. 
Um, and if you go into freelance writing, you will find yourself writing other things. I wrote the annual report for the electrical, electrical, electoral officer of uh, Saskatchewan. I wrote a history of the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Saskatchewan, which has the uh, gave me my longest title, which because that was part of it. Uh, I wrote a history of the Saskatchewan Land Surveyors Association. I wrote the history of the Saskatchewan Mining Association. I wrote the history of J.D. Mullard and Associates, which is a an engineering firm that has done a lot of work with remote sensing. I wrote a history of the mine rescue competition in Saskatchewan. I wrote a political book about the Grant Divine years in Saskatchewan. I rewrote and updated the history of Government House here in Saskatchewan. I've done all that. One of the weirdest ones, which was actually mentioned, Genetics Demystified from McGraw-Hill. I wrote an entire book on genetics without ever having studied genetics. I taught myself genetics to the point where I could write that book. I even did, and I still can't believe I did this, I did all the figures using, I don't know, some primitive computer program I had. I wrote all of the figures and illustrations. I did all that. I cannot remember a thing that's in that book, but I wrote it and it, you know, it had reasonably good reviews as a kind of starting point to learn uh, genetics. It's almost 20 years ago now, so it would be terribly out of date. Uh, another part of my long, strange trip. Some of the other things that I've written that never would have thought I was going to write. Uh, plays. I, I do have a, theatric, a theatrical side to me, and I'm a member of Canadian Actors' Equity, and I've done a lot of plays and operas and all that. It was mentioned. I've written a couple of plays and directed them, and uh, you know, never really would have thought of that back when I was heading out to be a, a writer. It was always going to be just novels, and yet here I am writing plays. And then one of the weirdest ones, I actually wrote, I actually wrote a poetry book. I do not self-identify as a poet. But in 2018, the Poet Laureate of Saskatchewan, uh, Gerald Hill, uh, for Poetry Month that year, sent out uh, every day for the month of April, two lines of po uh, poetry from published Saskatchewan poetry and challenged members of the Saskatchewan Writers Guild to write poems. And I latched onto that, much to my surprise. I wrote a poem every day, incorporating those two lines. But being who I am, they're all science fiction and fantasy poems. And at the end of, you know, a month, I had enough for a, a small book of poetry, 24 poems, I think it was. And I found uh, someone who would publish it. And I uh, hired my niece, actually, who's a very talented artist in Alberta, to illustrate it. And the result was I tumbled through the diamond dust, and I can now say I'm a poet. Still writing novels, you know, the Massive Agreement trilogy is E.C. Blake, Mage Bane is Lee Arthur Chain, the various uh, Edward Willett books uh, up to the last three, which are in the World Shaper series, the new one that's coming out, The Tangled Stars, I've written for smaller publishers. I've killed a number of publishers. I didn't anticipate that when I started my writing career, that my first publisher, unfortunately, that first one, I think, may still exist in some format, although the books have finally come back to me. Um, Lobster Press went under, Roussan, which published me, went under, Kato Books, which had been around for 40 years, published me and went broke. Bundoran Press uh, closed down, they had published me. One in Winnipeg that started up called Rebel Light published me and only lasted another year or so. so uh, Daw seems to be hanging in there. And I don't think it's my fault, but that has been part of my long, strange trip to this point. Um, so... I guess the point of all that is you don't know what your writing career is going to look like. I have 25 novels published, uh, 12 uh, through DAW, uh, all these others through the other publishers. Many of those that went under, I've now republished through Shadowclaw Press, which that's another thing I never thought I would be doing was, was starting a my own publishing company. Um, I never have gotten to the point where I can say the only thing I do is write fiction. That's still where I would like to get to. I'm going to be an overnight success any day now and just write fiction. But I don't regret writing all this other stuff uh, either. And uh, some of the rewards are unexpected, like uh, in Shadowpaw Press, it was mentioned the anthologies that I've uh, kickstarted, uh, Shapers of Worlds. If you had told me back in 1977 that I would be publishing a story in an anthology I had edited by Joe Haldeman, it would have blown my mind. That was, you know, I'd read The Forever War. To think that I would someday know him, had gone to dinner with him, had met him, had talked to him, and I was, I'd interviewed him, I was publishing him. And the podcast is another thing I never would have expected. I'm up to 115 episodes, and I'm, I've interviewed 
some of the biggest names in the field and people who are just starting out as well, talking about the creative process. I'm going to get a book out of that. I'm going to be writing a book maybe this this year, a nonfiction title, uh, talking about the creative process. So it has been a long, strange trip, and it's not the one that I expected that uh, I would be having to when I got this far into my career. But you know, I can't really say that I'm unhappy about it. Sometimes, my wife will say, sometimes I seem very unhappy about it, but I'm not really. I mean, I've written about things I never would have imagined I would be writing about. I've learned about things I never would have imagined I'd be writing about every every uh, topic under the sun. I've communicated with with other authors and people I would never have imagined I would be talking to. That That journalism background has come in really useful for all the interviewing and stuff I do. I think everything I've learned, and I hope that I've also provided enjoyment, enlightenment, and maybe better grades for school children <laughs> through my educational books. Uh, there's a lot of books, you know, this stuff I've created wouldn't have existed if I hadn't hadn't created it. So one of the questions I end with in World Shapers, and I'll kind of end with it here, is uh, why do you write? Why does anyone write? I get a lot of answers to that. And, you know, I've, I've often said I write fiction because it's fun, and to a large extent, that's true. I want to tell stories. I want to entertain people. I want to you know, express ideas, all of that. But I think it really comes down to, I want, it, I'm leaving a mark on the world in some fashion when I'm gone, which I hope is a very long time from now, there will still be some record of my existence and of all the hours, many, many, many hours I've spent at many, many, many keyboards typing many, many, many words. I'm, I'm leaving some kind of, of a record of my existence. And maybe I haven't changed the world. I really don't think I have. Maybe I've changed one or two people. Maybe. I don't know. But at least you can say, I was here. I existed. I created these things. And I don't think that's a bad legacy. Having said that, uh, a better legacy would be millions of dollars in income in my bank account that I can leave to my daughter. So if you would like to go out, buy my books, and tell all your friends and enemies to buy them too, that would be great. Thank you. And two things I wanted to reflect on here in terms of these two awesome keynotes. And the first, so so Hank went through those 10 things that she learned during the pandemic. She not only faced it head on, you know, I wasn't afraid to, to talk about obvious, what's like right in front of us, obviously, these past two years but also how she applied them so eloquently to the writer's life. And in particular, a couple of the things that she mentioned were the importance of patience, persistent, and the persistent and the devoted. I mean, she also talked about community and that value and the importance of community, which, which sort of harkens back to what we talked about in episode 263 and that importance of community that both Terry Brooks and Susanna Kearsley basically held up in high regard. And Hank did a brilliant job as well of talking about the invalue and the importance of of community. And and it, it's it's I guess because like the pandemic that's there, present, ever present for the last two years, uh, community is always there. But the community is always there, but it's not always obvious to us as writers. And and I really have been thinking a lot about that lately. Obviously, you go back to episode 262, when I t was reflecting on being back in my own hometown and the, the value of that community and what it meant to me and what it still means to me today. Just thinking about all of the things as I'm planning for trips to in-person conferences. I'm, you know, very soon, a month from today, I'll be in in Florida at St. Pete Beach for Novelist Inc. The first Novelist Inc. I will have been in person at since 2019. And so many things uh, about what we do as writers that are based on community. And... Also, finally, for, for that, just thinking about no matter, no matter what we're doing as writers, we're constantly absorbing, we're constantly taking things in to you, our writing, to become better writers. But Hank took the pandemic, you know, lots of negative things, etc., and looked at 10 things that she learned, like 10 positive things that she could walk away from. And as writers, we do have 
as I just mentioned, the ability to absorb and, 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 and use and leverage things in our writing, but thinking about how, no matter what it is that's happening, how we can learn and take away things that can make us better writers and better people is really, really awesome. And one of the things I really liked about Ed's journey and sharing the journey and, and those those stops along the way and the tangents and all the things that he was doing while well, all he wanted to do was write science fiction. For and, and he talks about, I'm going to have that overnight success any day now. That line in particular stuck out because he's been doing it for a long, long time. He's got a lot of books out there. He's got a lot of books out there that aren't even related to science fiction, but they were they were milestones along the way. He said he would not change a thing. And I think that's valuable as well, because in a very similar way, he's talking about this patience and <laughs> persistence and even and, and even being patient when things weren't going well. I'm going to write this book that is a topic that is not been like it is to, to write a science fiction novel, but I'm going to do it because it's a, it's a landmark all, along the way on this long term journey. And that's something we have to remember as well. Let's say, for example, in, in a few years, um, Ed has a uh, you know, multi-million dollar movie based on one of his books or a TV series or something like that. And we're going to go, well, where did he come from? I never heard of him. <laughs> Not realizing this incredibly long journey, all of the books, all of the work, all of the blood, all of the sweat, all of the tears that went into getting him to where he is today. And we always have to remember that as writers. And again, thinking about the long journey, thinking about the patience, thinking about the persistence, but always, always always reflecting on how we can leverage that community, that author community, the reader community, all of the communities that surround us to take us through those uh, moments and uh, be there to celebrate with us when the great things happen, but also be our consolation and our comfort when things don't go so well, because they don't always go so well. So that's it for my reflections for this episode. That's it for episode 264. Thanks so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed Hank Philippi Ryan and Edward Willett and in the previous episode, Terry Brooks and Susanna Kearsley. I hope you enjoyed the fact that I shared these keynotes with you because again, as I was listening to them, I thought, my goodness, there's so much, so much in there. There's so much inspiration and I knew that you, dear, dear listener, would get value in them. If you do get value in the podcast, one of the ways you can thank me is you can leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice. You can also share this with a friend that you think would would find this podcast useful, inspiring, entertaining, a time filler, any of those things, <laughs> any of those things. So thanks again for listening. Until next week, and not quite next week, it's going to be less than a week from today that the next episode comes out, but until the next episode... This is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.